Now, recall is a type of memory retrieval which essentially refers to reproducing information from one's long-term memory reserves to their current attention or consciousness. And ideally, recalling allows us to retrieve information without the help of any memory cues. However, this is not always the case, as in some specific scenarios, recall is initiated as a function of memory cue presentations. In summary, recall is a process which simply facilitates the transfer of information from one's LTM reserves to one's current attention with or in some cases without a memory cue. Now that we know what recall is, let's look at the different types of recall. There are three key types of recall. The first one is a serial recall, the second one is free recall, and the final one is queued recall. Let's look at each of these types of recall in a little more detail. Serial recall simply refers to recalling information sequentially in the order in which they have occurred. For example, if a friend asks you about your morning routine and you recall the events in the order in which they occurred, such as woke up in the morning, brushed my teeth, washed my face, took bath and finally had my breakfast, you essentially undertook serial recall. Now, two types of effects can impact our serial recall abilities and the accuracy of serial recall. The first effect is referred to as the recency effect and the second is referred to as the primacy effect. Recency effect occurs when we tend to recall the information that was active in the most recent past. For example, in a study undertaken by Glossner and Kunitz in 1966, they observed that participants tend to recall the words in the end of the list better than those in the middle of the list. The recency effect has also been considered as evidence for the existence of short-term memory storage or SDM and thus evidence for the Atkinson and Schifferin's multi-store memory model which we covered in the last memory storage video. Now the second type of effect that impacts serial recall is the primacy effect. Primacy effect refers to the ability to recall those events or information which occurs or appears originally in the earlier part of the list or an earlier time, that is, which were right at the start or beginning of an event or a list. The same study by Glasner and Kunitz undertaken in 1966 found evidence for the primacy effect. In the same study, they observed that participants were able to better recall the words at the start of the list along with the words in the end of the list showing evidence for the recency effect but not so much those in the middle of the list. Now the primacy effect finds evidence and support for the long-term memory storage or LTM reserves that we discussed in our previous video and therefore the primacy effect also finds evidence for the Atkinson and Schifferin's multi-store memory model. Moving on, the next type of recall that we cover is free recall. Moving on, the next type of recall that we cover is called as free recall. Free recall refers to recalling information in any order of occurrence without any regard for the order in which they occurred. Imagine the same example wherein you are trying to recall your morning routine. If your friend asks you to recall your morning routine and you start with recalling that you first woke up and then undertook the other activities like washing your face, brushing your teeth, eating your breakfast and bathing, then you just undertook free recall of the activities you did in the morning, even though the order in which you might have done them was not maintained in your recall. This is an example of free recall. 
Let's now move on to the last type of recall, which is queued recall. Now, queued recall refers to recalling information when it has been activated because of an external element referred to as a memory queue. A memory queue is anything that was either a part of the experience or environment in which the information was being encoded and stored and that earns the property of activating and initiating the memory because it was a part of the experience, the context or the environment in which the information was being encoded and stored. Now, usually, retrieval in the form of recall does not always require a queue to initiate and activate the memory, but queues actively facilitate, in some specific scenarios, the recall of information, and they can aid both serial as well as free recall. Let's look at an example to understand queued recall a little better. Imagine you went for a vacation, wherein, in a few occasions, you consumed a specific type of wine called rosé. Although you did not actively mean for this drink to be associated with the encoding of the vacation memories, the drink becomes a memory cue such that, in a different occasion, when you see or drink rosé, you immediately recall the information about your vacation when you had this drink and all the associated events that might have occurred. So this is an example of a queued recall wherein the drink rosé becomes a memory cue because it is a part of the experience of the memory of your vacation and thus gets associated with these memories of your vacation whereby enabling a queued recall of the same in an unrelated occasion. And in fact, memory cues play a very important role in scaffolding memory retrieval. Let's dive a little deeper into this and understand memory cues a little better and understand how these cues can impact our memory retrieval and recall. As stated before, memory cues are any item, context or situation that share similarities with the items or information stored in one's memory, such that they have the power and ability to evoke the A-like items and information stored in one's memory, such as the memory cue rosé that we just observed in the example of rosé and vacation. Memory cues can be of various types. They can be auditory memory cues, visual memory cues, order-based or smell-based memory cues, and contextual memory cues. Let's now move on to understanding the concept of encoding specificity principle, a principle that explains how memory retrieval cues help us in retrieving information. Now, the general principle that underlies the effectiveness of retrieval cues is the encoding specificity principle that was proposed by psychologists Stelving and Thompson in 1973. This principle states that when people encode information, they do so in specific ways. For example, take the example of a song on the radio that you heard. Perhaps you heard it while you were at a terrific party having a great philosophical conversation with a friend. This, this song became a part of the whole complex experience, just like the drink rosé in our vacation example. Years later, even though you haven't thought about that party in ages, when you hear that song on the radio, the whole experience rushes back to you. In general, the encoding specificity principle states that the extent of retrieval cue matches or overlaps the memory trace of an experience, it will be active in evoking the memory. In a classic experiment undertaken by the a classic ex Let's now move on to understanding the concept of encoding specificity principle, a principle that explains how memory retrieval cues help us in retrieving information. Now, 
The general principle that underlies the effectiveness of retrieval cues is the encoding specificity principle that was proposed by psychologists Stelving and Thompson in 1973. This principle states that when people encode information, they do so in specific ways. For example, take the example of a song on the radio that you heard. Perhaps you heard it while you were at a terrific party having a great philosophical conversation with a friend. This, the song became a part of the whole complex experience, just like the drink rosé in our vacation example. Years later, even though you haven't thought about that party in ages, when you hear that song on the radio, the whole experience rushes back to you. In general, the encoding specificity principle states that the extent of retrieval cue matches or overlaps the memory trace of an experience, it will be active in evoking the memory. A classic experiment on encoding specificity principle was undertaken by researchers Gordon and Badley in 1975. In this study, participants had to memorize a set of words in a unique setting. Let's call it context A. Later, the participants were tested on the word sets either in the same location, that is the context A, where they learned the words, or a different location, which for this example we can call context B. The results of the study indicated that, as a function of the encoding specificity principle, the students taking the test in context A, when they'd learned the words, were actually able to recall more words than the students who took the test in context B. In this instance, the physical context, which is where they took the test itself, proved to be working as a cue of retrieval. If you found today's video helpful, then please make sure to subscribe to Brain Cyclopedia for more such content. Also make sure to like this video Share this video with someone you think will benefit and send a comment below. Don't forget to press the bell icon to stay updated with all of our upcoming videos. Make sure to follow us on all of our social media sites on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. You can find the links of these below in the description box and you can also find the links on the channel banner. See you in our next video.